Hi, everyone. Um, we are going to get started. I know we already have a lot of people here, which is uh, awesome. My name is Smith Cataldo. I am the Curator of Contemporary Art at the Courier Museum, and we're so happy that everyone joined us today for a special talk with Larissa Bassler, who was an artist in residence at the museum last summer and who's created work um, from her experience that we'll be talking about and previewing today. Um, so before I get started, I do want to acknowledge that I myself am speaking to you from my home in Massachusetts on um, Pawtucket lands. And we're talking today about Manchester, New Hampshire, um, which is on the traditional lands and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and other related Wabanaki um, past and present. And Larissa is joining us from Berlin. From Hello. From across the seas. Um, so uh, as I said, um, this, this whole talk is in relation to the Courier Museum's Artist in Residence program, which began uh, in 2018. And it invites museums, uh, international, mu international, sorry, invites artists, uh, international artists such as Larissa, as well as national and local artists, um, to live and work at the museum for a period of time and look into different things that interest them related to their practice. And then they're invited to create new work or projects or programs with the museum um, if they uh, would so choose and then continue relationships with the museum as Larissa has done. Um, so to get started, I'm going to introduce Larissa and then she's going to give you a little overview of some of her past work. And then that'll really help you understand the work that she created based on her experience in Manchester, which we will be speaking about. Um, and I'll also note that we have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have any questions while we're speaking, feel free to put them in there and we'll try to answer them as we go, if it makes sense with the flow of the conversation. Otherwise, we'll take uh, questions at the end um, of today's talk and try to get to as many as we can. So thank you all again for coming. Uh, Larissa Fassler is a Canadian artist who has lived and worked in Berlin since 1999. She obtained her BFA from Concordia University in Montreal and an MFA from Goldsmiths College at the University of London. Her work has been exhibited internationally and is featured in numerous public and private collections. And she is the recipient of several grants from institutions such as the Canada Council for the Arts and the Paula Krasner Foundation, among others. Fassler's artistic practice is focused on the symbiotic relationships between people and places. She's interested in the architecture of cities and the way in which places affect people, both psychologically and physically. Fassler investigates populated sites, sketching and taking notes on her observations while also researching demographic data. She uses this information to create drawings, paintings, and sculptures that reflect her impressions of that space through intricate designs featuring maps, text notations, and imagery. While in residence at the Courier Museum in the summer of 2019, Fassler explored the neighborhoods surrounding the museum, particularly Manchester's downtown core. Following her time in residence, she produced large scale drawings of the area, which we will get a sneak preview of today and which will be on view in their full glory um, later this year at the museum. So it dates to be announced on that. So we hope this um, whets your appetite. So I'm going to hand it over to Larissa, who's going to talk about uh, two past projects in Paris and New York, and then we're going to talk about Manchester. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, as Sam said, um, for about 15 years now, I've been thinking about urban space and urban public space and trying to see how the shape of that space and the built environment affects users and inhabitants and then vice versa. Again, how people re-impact their built environment. Um, so I'm going to share my screen in just a minute. Good. So this is um, an overview of the last 15 years of my work. And it's, uh, as you can see, the, the core of my practice is actually based in Berlin, the city in which I live. Uh, Alexanderplatz, Kockbuster Tor, Moritzplatz, those are all different locations. Then there's a group of work that looks at Paris, another city that I spend a lot of time in and think about also in comparison to how German cities work. Then there was a kind of an exception where I was in Istanbul looking at Taksim Square. And then a group of works um, thinking about North American uh, cities and North American public space. And again, how these very much differ from European cities. And as Sam said, today I'm gonna 
talk about two before we talk about the Manchester work. So I'm going to talk about uh, Gare du Nord, the North train station in Paris. And I'm also going to talk about Columbus Circle in New York City. So this is the Gare du Nord. It's beautiful facade. It's um, a train station in the north of Paris that, that connects that city to the north. So it connects, this is the Statue of Paris. Then it also connects that second layer of women. Each woman represents a northern city. So we have London, Amsterdam, Brussels, Berlin, and it continues to the northern European. Then on the middle layer of the train station, we also have the northern French cities and each of those women represent one of the northern cities of France. And then on the lower level and in that train station, you have the connection to the, the subway, but more importantly, you have the connection to the northern banlieue of Paris, the northern suburbs. And this is a commuter train station. So there's hundreds of thousands of people using this train station every day. And I was really drawn to it. I'm always drawn to sites that are contested, sites that are um, difficult to map and understand, uh, hot spots, places of tension, places that are, are working well and are like pretty little plazas, I find have, as an artist, I find have less meat to, to look at and really get into. And so the Gare du Nord was kind of key for me because one, it's this labyrinth of platforms. Um, inside you see the main beautiful hallways of a classic uh, European train station. Um, this is the other view. It's, it's, as I said, it's hundreds of thousands of people use this train station every day. It's a site that's representative of France more generally for a lot of reasons. One would be issues of security. So you've got um, in the station, you would have the military walking through with their AK-47s. You have a police station in the train station that does a lot of stop and search actions. You have orange vested security guards also functioning in the station. Around outside the station, there's a fair bit of homelessness and destitution which also kind of reflects on French society more generally. And then this station, and I'll get into it a bit later in the project, also raises a lot of questions of race and race in Paris. And so I was really drawn to this site. This is what the underground platforms look like. This is the RER level of the train station that connects to the northern suburbs. Another view of just how packed it can get at rush hour. So this is in 2014. I was on residence in Paris for three months, similar to the residency I did in Manchester. And I sort of would go to the site every day. I made it a rule that I wouldn't miss a day. And if I really didn't feel like going, I would only go for an hour, but I had to be there. And so I would go into the train station and hang out from anywhere from one hour to six hours. And while I was in there, I'd have my little note paper and I'd be mapping, this is a, one of the metro platforms. So how the tunnels connect, where the stairs are, where the escalators are, what kind of signage is there. There, You see a little dashed line with an arrow. Those are security cameras and in what angles they point. And at the same time as I'm mapping and sitting and watching, I'm also watching people. So I'm collecting data as what people are wearing, how they're moving through the station, who's there. This is another view of another part of the train station where I was trying to understand the overlaying, there's two floors. So the, the red dashed lines is a, a, a floor above me and then the black lines are a flow, a fo, flow, or floor below. Um, and as you can see, these are, these are small sketches done on a normal sheet of white paper. And by the end of my residency, I had hundreds of these sketches. And I would often go back and sketch the same site repeatedly. It, it allowed me to understand the proportions better, but I also liked my misunderstandings that the two drawings are not the same length and don't have the same information. Uh, the red dots would be where security men are and at what times they move. And again, on the middle bridge here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that's where police officers were moving. Larissa, as you're speaking, I have yeah. a sense that I have a sense you will bring this up um, because it is part of the story. But we do have a question who from Susan, who is wondering if you ever got stopped and questioned by the police while you were doing this work at Garden Nord. Yeah, am amazingly, in the 15 years of my practice, Garden Nord was the only place where security immediately stopped me. 
Um, so within the first few hours, they wanted to know what I was drawing and why I was drawing it. And um, I was asked to leave. I wasn't allowed back in the station. And so I had to get a proper permission to be in the station, a letter from, as, it, as film crews would in any city and have permission. And then I would repeatedly have to show that letter. And I was asked for that letter every day. But interestingly, in all the other cities I've worked in, I've never had an issue with security, except in Paris. And this was before the Paris um, uh, terrorist uh, attacks. So the, the height security in, in train stations has been an issue anyways. Thank you. This is what the, the end result a year later, what the exhibition looked like. And I, I had three kind of these cream colored paintings in the first room and in the back room, very colorful paintings. And I combined them with those images of the facade. And these, these women are those facade figures. And I printed them on a home printer on my little white pieces of paper and then uh, pasted the image on the wall. So those actually break up and are, are multiple of different papers glued to the wall. And I liked the contrast between sort of the ideals and the romanticism of architecture in those facade figures and then the reality in the station and on the ground. And it, it's quite a, it's interesting, the outside of the Garden Or, it's quite filthy. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bodily experience. It's, it smells of urine, people pee outside. It's quite filthy, it's hot and windy. You, you go into the station and there's that real heightened sense of cure, control and security and it's clean. So there's a, a real contrast between the indoor and outdoor spaces. That's um, the view of the painting on the wall print. And this painting was documenting, as I said, every single security camera in the station and in what angle they point. So that, that's, a, that's a zoom. And I'll just go a little bit closer so you can see the, what I meant by security camera and in the angle. And I'll go back and just say that I decided with this piece not to offer viewers a map where you could understand the station. Rather, I wanted to give you a map that made you start to feel what it was like to be in there. So shifting planes, not being able to understand where tunnels go, the idea of getting lost. Those are, so those are some of the feelings I wanted this map to speak about. The second painting, again, it's these overlapping structures. Um, uh, the red sort of swoosh and the tall uh, vertical, those are the underground, the RER, where you saw in that uh, rush hour moment that how full it was. Then over on the left side of the painting would be that main hall where you have that beautiful glass roofs. And then at the lower half of the painting is the, some of the metro tunnels. And I'm gonna read you, cause it's, uh, you probably can read on your screen, but as you're looking at the text, I'm just gonna read you some of the observations I was making. Two white girls sit on the ground on a bridge, bags, coin, water bottle, and books all over. Really strong smell of perfume, smell of piss in the wind, Police have taken someone into custody, middle-aged white guy. Two officers, a man and a woman, escort him into the station. Another young woman carrying a little baby asking for money. Man roasting corn of cob in a shopping trolley. Black man in electric wheelchair rolls by wearing a Superman t-shirt and a Superman cape. Bicycle police stop and search action. They have stopped a dark-skinned man with a large dark beard, Bangladeshi perhaps asking for his papers. Japanese girl with a suitcase wearing a surgical mask watches. Black man sitting on railing watching cops. Black track pants, black leather t-shirt, gold rim sunglasses, gold watch. Tall white man in a white t-shirt staring at me. I dream about the garden or every night. A scrawny man with a mustache in a pink t-shirt and shorts asks me to please come with him. I understood him to be undercover security. Then I woke up. First elevator, totally filthy, ceiling of smashed glass. Bang, girl drops her suitcase. Three army men walk, large black guns. White woman, older, sitting on the ground, gray high tops, open, her ankles and calves, covered in sores that look like bloody mosquito bites. Very large black man, older, half naked, dressed in green canvas rags, surprises me when he produces a metro ticket and enters the metro. And these go on and on and on. There are hundred, hundreds of notes. And I'm sure, it, or possibly it caught your ear, it did, it was something new for me to try to start to talk about race. And this is where Garden Noor started to get interesting for me as being there, you realize that it's a predominantly black space. This, this is a commuter train station to mostly black neighborhoods. And then right beside Garden Noor is the big Indian community. 
and right to the south is Algerian North African. And I started to understand how Paris is now a much more multicultural city than I am in my own imagination. And I think even in Paris's imaginings of itself, that it is not a white city. And so I was trying to, even in the writing, talk about race and talk about visibility and who's using these spaces. So this was the first time for me where I was naming race. And as a Canadian, it feels uncomfortable and I'm not sure yet how this works, but it was a, an important attempt for me to, to write like this. Um, and, it, and it goes into another step. So, oh, this is another, the, another detail. And again, as I was talking about not producing clean maps, rather smearing and having more in, about smell and bodily impact and kind of a, a map that is destroyed. Uh, I'm getting more, and you'll see this in the Manchester works later, um, gesture and mark making is, is important for me as a way to carry an emotional understanding of place. Uh, and th thinking again also about race in Paris, it, it again came to mind with these images, which were um, the SNCF, who are the people that are, are kind of redesigning the station of the future, and it's going to be re, re kind of furbished for 2023 or 2024. And the renderings that the SNCF put out, if you notice, they ed edited out most people of color and they've turned it into quite a white space. And I found this rather appalling and difficult to get my head around because Garden Noor actually is full of this. This is uh, Dutch, um, West African Dutch wax prints. I would say about 40% of the people walking through the train station, men and women are dressed head to toe in African Dutch wax print. And I was trying also to think of way, well, how would you, how would you put these motifs and how would you how would you recodify Garden Noor with this in mind? And so the last two paintings that I did uh, pulled from the Dutch wax prints, and there you see the big flower motifs. And I wanted to re-stamp that on the Garden Or. And the oranges are the, kind of the hot zones of security, where there was a lot of kind of security measures and actions. That's the, some of the layering effects you see in the paintings. Um, and there's the last of the paintings of Garden Or. And again, it's dealing with the textiles from the Dutch wax prints. And I was putting them in in pencil and trying to get the idea of thread or pulled thread from, from the textiles. Sam, I don't know if you have any, if you have a question before we move on to New York. I, I don't have a question. If other people have questions, want to uh, ask them. I did ask one that came in. I will preface New York because um, I didn't say to start and a lot of people have asked because, uh, and, and I will say, I tried to think of who's all in, or in this meeting. And I think some people here are people that we're lucky to meet Larissa when she was here or hear Larissa speak because she did meet with um, several different uh, groups from students at our nearby um, Art Institute, um, now at New England College, uh, as well as groups from uh, within the uh, Courier's Orbit and community groups. Um, I do have oh, one question and I think Larissa, you can take this. Um, someone who just wants a little bit more information on um, Dutch wax prints and sort of the history of that name and what's the what's the Dutch wax part of it? Oh yeah, it, it's complicated. It, it is complicated. <laughs> That's yeah. why I have fun answering it. I, I hope I get it right. It's um so it's when the Dutch had colonies in Africa, they wanted to resell and remarket textiles to the African market, so they had. Um, they developed with their designers these kind of motifs. The motifs were then batiked and printed in Indonesia, uh, which were then shipped back into Africa. And so the, it's, I find it really interesting that those are classically African textiles, and yet they are produced by the Dutch through um, Indonesia. And now, of course, the market's been completely cornered by China, and it's China who's the major producer of Dutch wax prints for Africa. I think you you summed that up pretty well. That's my basic understanding too. But we definitely yeah, that, it, there, it, there's it, probably it, more nuance to that. It's no. a loaded and problematic uh, history and conversations a lot of people are having about now. So actually, it's very timely, which brings us to this um, second um, second project that we're going to briefly talk about the Manchester drawings. And what I was starting to say before we answer that questions was that people often ask you know, where did you even find Larissa's work? Obviously, you're based in, in Berlin. Um, and the first work that I encountered was actually this, this group of works that you're talking about, uh, about Columbus Circle um, in New York City, 
um, a few years ago, which is what brought me to reach out and start a dialogue with you and invite you to um, Manchester. So I thought that was of note. Um, and, and as we'll see, people uh, will notice that this project that happened a few years ago at this point is perhaps uh, by the day more and more relevant. So I'll just invite you um, to get into that um, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Um, so Columbus Circle is on the corner of um, Central Park. I, um, I guess I should say the invitation, sometimes I choose the sites myself and then sometimes like with Manchester, I'm invited. And this work came about is that my gallery was gonna go to the Armory show in 2018. And so in 2017, they asked if I would like to develop a work specifically about New York for New York. And this is in 2017. I was there in December. And I guess what's interesting is that uh, Charlottesville happened in August, 2017. So the whole debate about um, the Robert E. Lee statues and if they should be pulled down and that, that was sort of all throughout that summer and the kind of complicated dialogue around those sculptures. And then come um, sort of December, there was a lot of writing, actually I should say all through that fall about the statues in New York and then I guess Columbus Day happened. And so there was a big discussion about uh, Columbus who stands in the middle of this circle. And it, it kind of became really interesting for me because yes, it's also public space. There's that little tiny plaza. There's all of those kind of sidewalks on the edge. And then in the middle stands the figure of Columbus. And I started reading about all of the, the debate that was happening around that statue and kind of the complicated attachment uh, that New Yorkers have and especially the Italian community and then how that fits into New York politics. And it was sort of a really interesting uh, debate. And um, I'm just gonna show that image. I find I'm always drawn to, I'm drawn to two aspects of, of places. I'm, I like to physically map using my own body. And so I'll go and I'll walk and I'll loiter and I'll spend tons of time and I'll really watch the individual and collect those individual moments. But more and more, I'm also interested in kind of the big systematic um, pressures on place. So whether in, in Paris, it's questions of like access to the city and how long it takes you to get from the northern suburbs and who has the right to the city. And then in, in New York, it became very much the discussion of power and, the, and symbolism and the symbolism place and Christopher Columbus. Um, so it has, the works often have these kind of two levels of an inter, a very immediate uh, individual level and then a more structural level. So there were two paintings produced and then again, this wallpaper produced with these individual white pieces of paper printed on a home printer. Just a, an image, uh, so you get a sense of the scale. There's, um, there's only a slight shift in these paintings in that there's a time difference. So the light subtly changes on the reflections of those buildings. It, it's wintertime, it starts to get cooler. So the shadows on the one on the right cool down. You can notice there's more NYPD that have arrived. Those are those blue little labels. I'll zoom in a minute. The statue, the, the shadow starts to shift. And then all of those narrative stories have, have changed over the two paintings. Um, and I'm just going to, again, read you the, these, these headlines from the whole discussion around sculptures and statues. And um, they were, I put them in a pencil on the background of this painting and then smeared them kind of into the white paint. And they're things like Columbus Day, Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples Day, the problem with discovery, no longer on a pedestal, New York debates Christopher Columbus statues and the explorer's legacy. Christopher Columbus, explorer and Italian cultural hero. How Columbus sailed into US history, thanks to the Italians. Parade fans the flame of ongoing Columbus statue debate. Should the United States celebrate Columbus Day? When is it right to remove a statue? Things to think about when taking down statues. Art historians say New York City's offensive statues should, should be annotated, not removed. So I also found it interesting to, to start to get kind of both sides of how people were discussing um, the topic. And then, and then this narrative storytelling. And in New York, it was, it was great because some places get a little bit heavy where a lot of the conversation is about security or about poverty. 
And what I loved about New York is also how, <laughs> how showy New Yorkers are and how up for spectacle in public space and a lot of overheard conversations. And so I found that there was a, a lot of humor and I really enjoyed kind of collecting the stories and we do have time. So I'm just going to quickly read also a little bit of the New York vibe and how it felt different than the other places. Woman, high heels, fancy dress, leggings, tiny coat. It's cold out here. Woman in shiny gold parka. Nine taxis in front of the Time Warner Center. What's up, man yells to a woman. How are you, she says, smiling. Tired, how are you? Woman laughs, the same. Whole Foods man comes running out, carrying shopping for a woman. He places six large full bags at her feet. Woman is holding and looking at a receipt. The receipt goes from her chest down to her knees. Constant sound of honking. Whole Foods man carries out three more bags to the woman. Another woman joins her with more bags and arms full of flowers. They now have 11 bags. The woman with flowers hands the man a tip. A man walks up to a woman who is sitting on a security bollard. You've literally been shopping all day, he says incredulously. Young man on a phone. You need to be less aggressive. This is worth millions. Super thin woman, 60s, in jogging gear, seems exhausted, jogs towards the statue. Her thighs are thinner than her calves. Construction worker, desert boots, baseball hat, jacket, hoodie, slowly walks across the street on a red light. A taxi honks at him. Get out, he yells, and I'll punch your face. Man holding a can of Coke in one hand and pushing a large stroller with the other. The stroller is full of four Pomeranians, all wearing pink collars and a little pink sweater. Little pink sweaters. Big, tall, white man, 50-ish. 50-ish. Fist bumps and high fives with another man. The two men are laughing. The smaller man is so excited he is almost jumping up and down. The taller man slaps his back, laughing really hard. Young white woman in cream colored heels, light teal skirt, light teal fur coat, small cream colored shopping bag, hanging from her raised arm, teal leather gloves. Mother yanks boy trying to cross the street before the light turns red. He falls to his knees. She drags him a few steps and picks him up and they both run the rest of the way. So that's sort of the end of, of New York. Uh, thank you for sharing, for reading some of those, because I think that does get to uh, some of the fun in the drawings and part of why we're calling our little reveal of the Manchester drawings just a sneak peek because it can't be really seen uh, on, on the screen. And our, one in particular to see is quite large and we're really, hope, we're really excited um, to be having them at the Courier at some point in the future. Um, again, all things unknown, as in so many of our lives right now. Um, and so we hope everyone on this call is excited to come in and see them in person. Um, but before we get into them, I think you can maybe move ahead to the next screen, but I would like to give just a little bit of um, color, color commentary on kind of the coming you know, coming to Manchester when Larissa first got here. Um, and so we, as you can tell from the past two projects that she shared, which is uh, why, why we thought that would be a good intro, the observations are incredibly subjective, but they're mm -hmm. often layered with very objective data and doc documentation. Um, and so you get these impressions of a city, uh, in these cases, in New York's case, a city you were less familiar with, in Paris, a place that you've spent uh, a little bit more time relatively. And then coming to Manchester, you had never, ever, ever been to Manchester. Your first introduction into the city is me driving you in from the airport um, and then getting to our artist in residence house and then from there starting to explore. And we did first, um, we had some conversations about what neighborhoods, where mm -hmm. you might go looking. Um, and so we went for a little drive around the larger, uh, the larger city further parts with a colleague of mine, Lynn, um, who has lived in the area most all of her life. Um, and we got and gave Larissa some background, different places. And ultimately, Larissa, do you want to talk about your decision, uh, your focus, and why you found it important to stay, you know, close, close to where you were living at next to the museum? Yeah, I think the next slide shows the area I chose. It, I mean, it was really interesting because even the first night, I remember I, was, I said to Sam, I'm going to go for a walk. And Sam was like, oh, oh, uh, go down Bridge Street, like maybe not that street. And I thought, oh, right, I hadn't even 
I'm so used to living in cities where walking out at night is not an issue that it was interesting. I had not, I naively perhaps had not expected that me walking out in the evening alone would, would cause alarm. And so already there was an interesting thing. Okay, but okay, so walking in this city might be different. And then uh, exploring the first few days and I walked north from my home by the Courier Museum and realized, oh, there it, it keeps going residential, 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 hardly anyone else out, out on the street. And I started to realize, oh, there's not many pedestrians, there's not many people walking. And this all kind of started to raise questions like, oh, why, did, why does this place function like this? And I, I guess I should say that with all the projects, I Yes, I do pre-research, but when I get to the site, I let the site tell me what it's about. And so very quickly with Manchester, I started trying to think about um, walkability in a city, pedestrianism, what it means for a city to be car focused or car led. Uh, I worked a lot in Calgary also, and there are similarities with Calgary. I mean, of course, the strong grid city, uh, car focused, sidewalks would often run out and break. And so um, it, it was a completely different experience than the mega kind of urban places I've been, I was working in. Um, at the top of the image, you can see Elm Street with all the restaurants. And yes, that I felt buzzy in the evening and lots of people were out. And it, I know over the next coming, I spent six, seven weeks um, exploring this area. And you can see the ebb and flow of people being out at lunchtime and then it going quiet and then being out at dinner time and then it going very quiet. And then realizing okay, let's, what happens, what happens in these next blocks behind? Because they're really well manicured and really pretty. And um, then, then you start to, and then, and then, of, uh, I mean, Sam had already told me that this is a, the things I knew about Manchester coming was this idea of um, post-industrial New England town trying to reboot the whole history of the mills and kind of um, different attempts, 60s, 70s, 90s to, to reboot the mills and reboot economy. And that, Manchester is a city that is struggling kind of to, to, to reestablish its, its place. And then issues also, of course, of poverty and of opioid crisis that, and you, you, of course, everyone feels that when you walk across that behind the downtown. So um, I would say the first park I hit would have been, uh, now I'm going to forget the name, in front of the public library, is that Victory? Oh, that's Victory, yes, in front of, but you would have probably, depending on Victory how you and walk, Veterans, right? Yep. Yeah. And of course, I, I haven't seen the effect of the opioid crisis on a city. We don't have that here like this. And so to, to see this is hot summertime. So to see it look like a beach where people have their towels and their blankets out and their chairs, and then you realize not at all, like it's all people kind of off their heads or homeless or and so and then to think about these spaces, it also means that other people don't use these spaces. So this whole kind of back behind Elm Street is in a weird way emptied or because college wasn't yet in session and the universities weren't yet functioning. And so I'm, I was really spending a lot of time trying to figure out what is the core of the city and how does it function? And then, of course, on, on Manchester Street itself, where you have this whole, the whole street kind of empties out and people don't walk there because of uh, the back of the fire station, these big empty lots. I'm, I must say there's also this really interesting feeling to me in the urban fabric of the city that it goes building, empty lot, building, empty lot, building, empty lot, uh, and those empty lots being private parking places, how much that chews up that urban environment, but also how it feels rather unsafe, those kind of alleyways, empty lots, no kind of not much street life. So those are kind of all of the questions I was spiraling around. Yeah, and I think, uh, and one of the things that uh, you had done is you didn't want to do too much research or or talk to folks or um, or really do any of that until you had already set all of your own impressions of a space through, through walking. Um, and it was also interesting when you would come back and have um, conversations with the staff. Um, and obviously, as as I mentioned at the start of the talk, I don't live in Manchester myself. So I also have a view of it that's completely nine to five weekdays. And then, of course, sometimes I'm there on the weekends. Um, but we have lots of staff who has lived there for a very long time and would have different views on things. But 
a light note on this because some of it will get sort of intense <laughs> found was uh, just when you said there was so many parking lots that nobody uses and everyone would be like, what do you mean there's never any parking downtown? Um, and so the kind of you noticing all these open lots and us anecdotally always knowing that when we have to downtown or something, we can bring it parking, underscored that private park, the specific of the private parking lots that you noted and that utilization um, of that land. And so I always, so I, I thought that was kind of funny whenever you talked about the parking, when you showed all the parking lots, people would be yeah, like, yeah, well, I'll, I'll show the next slide. Cause they're there. This is the map that I would have in my pocket that I'd walk around with. And all of the red is parking. So it's, I, I, I find it just crazy how much parking, how, how much is taken up by a car and car led. And, uh, and then also then you notice these things like I, I found a little gym and so I walked to that gym and then I walked and I noticed that other people who were going to the gym would jump in their car and then drive down the street and go to a cafe. And so I noticed that even in spring and summertime, car culture and the jumping into your car to go to your next site instead of the walk. Um, but there's, there's, we can get into this later. There's also lots of reasons why that walk is not particularly enjoyable. And so also the kind of those two things impact another. So I'll just, I'll go a little bit through the working process. This was the map I had with me always. And then the numbers across it, M4, M1, all that, that's just to reference my, my notebooks. Um, I'll show a notebook in a moment. This is the drawing in the studio where I had um, in the artist's house. Uh, and this is the very early layers of the drawing that developed on my on the wall. You can see some of the research and there's a I'll just make your eye go to that blue image on the wall. And that's uh, one of the crime maps of the city, dark blue being the worst crime. And so I was starting with that as a as a layer on my map, it, the purples, then red, then there's kind of a peachy color. Um, so I was I was thinking it almost as as bruising or bruising came up later and like in the garden or where I was had those smeary images and I was trying trying to I was trying to build up a material base that the rest would go on top of and so the yellow in the on the wall or the yellow on my drawing are the parking lots and then the white the the, the, the kind of aggressive erasing of sites and pulling them out were sites in the city where either it's a non-place so on the north or on the opposite side of Elm Street it was just big parking garages and giant big parking so there was kind of nothing there are two places where no other people in the city would go except those using drugs and kind of suffering from homelessness. And they also, in a way, became these kind of non-places because they, they are not functioning. And so they, for me, there was a, all, my, also thinking about invisibility and the erasing of people. So, so that, that was the act then of re-erasing. These are the two little notebooks I would w walk around with. They look big there, but they're small. Um, I had the map on the first page so I could put a note and then put a number of where it would be. And then I would be, again, daily going out and walking around and hanging out and looking and loitering uh, and taking all these little different kinds of notes. Uh, that's the Victory Park, kind of all the things that are happening in front of the library. Public library was interesting. It's a similar um, situation in Calgary where the public library becomes a de facto drop-in center for people that don't have another place to be in the daytime. You have internet access, you have a toilet, it's quiet, you can sit, no one bothers you. And so I, I had a very similar experience in there as in Calgary. It was interesting though that that is becoming the new role for a library. Um, all of those notes I then scanned, cut up, and then on my table in the studio had to regroup them because I needed to know what notes were happening in what area so that those could all then get written onto the, the giant drawing. And so that was kind of an overview of all my different notes. And then that's the drawing in my studio. It's a um, five meter, not five meter, five foot high, 12 foot long, four panel piece. And you can see that built up red, yellow, eraser mark, underlayer, and then on top, um, all the other information. So buildings goes on top, uh, signage um, also, and then, and then getting into the layers, as I said about this bigger systematic layer, I started uh, doing more heavy statistical research on Manchester and that was a, a top layer, but I'm gonna get into that in a minute. Um, is, sorry, 
No, that's okay. I just wanted to ask because I think people might be wondering, I should have asked when you were showing the studio picture, the colors that you chose um, to work with came from a specific process of image taking that you did when you first got, when you were first walking around. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I was photographing um, just generally and then getting back into my studio, kind of looking at kind of getting, trying to get a color field of Manchester. And of course the red bricks uh, came very, were really strong. And so I, the colors were based on color, major colors I was finding in Manchester. Of course, then with the pencil crayon marks, they are much lighter than the actual colors of Manchester, but those, they're pulled from what the cityscape feels like and looks like. But I, I moved away from that connection to city and got more into the connection to the, to the body and, and a body bruised. Um, this, is a, this is then the overview. Um, so again, we've got Elm Street up at the top. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately going to be a little bit out of focus. I've got better details in a minute. One thing that, that became very apparent and then a the next step that that I undertook and then Samo was always accompanying me was starting to realize that everything behind Elm Street or the majority of the things in this part of the city, the things that were active were social services and you had all kinds of sites dealing with poverty, with people in uh, precarity, opioid. And so you had, uh, um, can, can one see my mouse? I'm not sure. Um, Okay, uh, then there was a homeless shelter that for, no, it was men's apartment. Men have just come out of homelessness. There's of course, um, Vic Veterans Park. Uh, there's the mission. Then we have the fire hall dealing mostly with opioid overdoses. Then we had the shelter whose name is escaping me at the moment. Um, uh, uh, emergency shelter for families and homeless. Then we, you have low income housing for elderly. Moving over, you have the public library as this de facto drop-in center. Above, you have Victory Park, which was just full of people with, uh, dealing with the opioid crisis. Then up here, YWCA, um, housing also women suffering, suffering from domestic violence and all the other programs that YWCA runs. Then we had um, SHNU and Waypoint who were running um, a center for new Americans and all kinds of pro, oh no, sorry, that's why WCA and the SHNU center for new Americans and all the kind of support, mainly for children through camps and soccer and games for with, to encourage sort of uh, integration, interaction, acceptance. Next to them, you had Waypoint dealing with elder poverty and homeless teens uh, and teens in poverty. Next to that, there's Helping Hands, dealing with helping men who are recovering from opioid addiction. Then there's the Kalmut House down here, men newly released from prison. And so I was just kind of jaw dropped at the concentration of services in this area that are offered to people in extreme need. And again, there was sort of this, I just find it it's a very dense site of a lot of kind of complicated issues. I will go to the next, sorry, Sam, do you wanna? I was gonna say, so I think, um, you know, we're just looking at details and I think what we should also say that the intent, your intent at first was this one large drawing, which was fabulous and we we're so excited and, and you, you kind of felt like you'd gotten everything into it and then uh, I'm also kind of answering one of these questions, uh, which I'll get to at the end. Uh, someone had asked, what have you been doing now, given the pandemic and everything that's going on? And one of the things that happened with the onset of the pandemic, especially starting more in Europe, where you were, is that you did find a little bit more time and you started thinking about Manchester again. And what came out of that is three additional drawings, which I know you're going to talk about in a little bit, because we don't have as high res images of them. So we'll do a little bit of a preview of them. But um, as you're leading into that, if you kind of want to talk about that process of going from this concentration of ideas that you've just explored, the way that you've um, given them out into the three additional drawings. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'll just finish with these. Um, of course, another really important issue that I love to research is the signage of public space and I, how much that 
also talks about how a city talks about itself. And so in Berlin, the sites I look at have a lot of political postering, a lot of kind of left-wing, uh, pro-refugee, uh, a lot of um, fashion, a lot of uh, kind of punk. Uh, and so it's, it's a really active space. I'm always kind of amazed when I get, and I know that this would, I'm generalizing, but when you, Calgary had the same kind of issue that the dominant signage of public space were the rules, private property, uh, no loitering, security cameras, people are watching, da da da. And so I'm, uh, it, also, it also speaks to a tone of, ha of how public space is used and who, who is welcome in public space and who can also impact and put their voice back onto public space. Um, and then a final layer in this big drawing was this um, deeper research. So thinking about all of those different services and who they're helping and supporting, and then trying to think about why is their generation, why is the generation poverty in Manchester so serious? And thinking about um, the minimum wage, and then this whole part of the drawing deals with how the minimum wage was supposed to increase, and then it was vetoed, and that kind of back and forth. There are other parts of the drawing that deal with opioids, the number of ODs, how that situation is improving or getting worse. Issue, and then there were issues, research deeper into homelessness and effects of homelessness. Looking at education and the underfunding to Manchester schools, uh, looking at the dropout rates for high schools. This, that top left corner just breaks my heart. Students who agree strong, students who agree or strongly agree that they feel like they matter to people in their community, 44%. And there's just there's and this is what Sam said, but it gets a bit heavy. Um, this is around the mayor's uh, city hall and kind of who hangs out on that little plaza. Also, the rent prices they pop up as these um, from Zillow these kind of uh, rent bubbles and how high the rents are. Um, and okay, I just don't want to run out of time. I'm going to read just a few notes from the Manchester drawing. This is around the public library. I'm sitting on a bench in front of the library. Although there are two benches in front of the library, there is also a sign that says no loitering. A woman who spent ages in the library's one bathroom is now sitting on the steps. A man and a woman in plain clothes with badges around their necks approach her. You all right, asks the man. The woman who was slumped over sits up and mumbles yes. Man, you're not gonna pass out on me, are you? No, sir, says the woman, gets up and moves on. The two officers turn towards me. The male officer eyes me and says hello. I return his hello, looking him in the eye. Man, very high, his head lolling from side to side, his chin occasionally hitting his chest, walks to his car with keys and hands. He opens the passenger door, puts something inside and shuts the door again and locks it. He turns, walks away, his arms and hands up and out as if he were flying. I'm walking across the park. Someone calls out, nice hair. I look for the voice and see a young, fuller black man propped up on his elbows among six sleeping prostate bodies. Thank you, I say back. Have a good day, he calls out. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna quickly fly. These are the sneak freaks, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, so yeah, I had three months in home, uh, home office, home studio, and so I produced three new drawings. These are details. This is one where I flip the drawing and it concentrates on Elm Street, and then the hinterland is kind of behind and I pulled out one menu item from every restaurant plus its price and the whole street has its sort of food menu and prices um, scrolling across it. The other thing that happened uh, on my last week of Manchester was the big Trump rally in the stadium. This is the intersection in front of the Trump rally, which I always had a hell of a time crossing because I'd have to walk to Market Basket to get food or was my choice to. Um, and this idea of walkability and how far grocery stores are and food deserts and poverty linked and food security. And that intersection always took me about six minutes to cross one way and then about eight minutes to cross the other until I learned that you need to run diagonally. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Trump rally that happened. So it was a collection of the, not only the demonstrators, a demonst the kind of against the side and the pro, plus all of the little interactions that I was observing in the rally crowd, um, their comments, their kind of interactions. And the very last drawing, which I think might be actually the first drawing uh, to introduce the room, is kind of zooming out to that really systematic, systemic kind of level and thinking about cities from a kind of a far perspective and 
this is a, a symbolic diagram of what makes a good place and what how a public place can be ideally and i like this idea of of zooming out and thinking about things like welcoming friendly pride neighborly cooperative stewardship diverse green clean walkable sitable spiritual charming attractive historic and of course manchester has so many of those qualities but it's it i think it's an interesting way to also think think about the city is in in this in this farther off perspective and get out of that detailed perspective and i think uh, on on my side i'll finish there and, and open it up to questions yeah we have um plenty of questions to get to and i'll just say on this last one that you're on um and selfishly, I, I got the lovely treats of Larissa sending me emails being like, I just did another drawing, which we weren't expecting. As she said, she wasn't expecting to do additional ones. Um, but I do feel that the, these three additional drawings have added so much to that one big, as we've been using the word, heavy drawing. Mm -hmm. And in this one, what we talked about, um, and I'm sure as some of you saw it when Larissa was zooming in, her kind of hand drawings, especially of the, the buildings, the lovely churches and more traditional buildings in our city, um, are just so beautifully rendered. And so having this where it's even in pencil, it's just in pencil, you still get like the lushness of the trees and the natural environment, which is so much of how New Hampshireites envision the state, uh, I, I feel, or at least how it's projected outwards towards other states and, vis and visitors coming in. It's about the, the green space and the mountains and, and the uh, outdoor sports and things like that. Um, and so to have something that backs it up to, as you said, this more eagle eyed view um, yeah. that people can have is really great. To that, someone asked a question, um, Michelle asked, how do you get the aerial shots? So they, these angles that you're using to create the drawings. Yeah, so that's been an interesting move in my, pro in my whole practice because at the beginning I would not use pre-existing maps or Google and uh, I, I wanted to be on site drawing and sketching by hand and that's the Gare du Nord. But then uh, recently because I'm in the zoomed out angle, I'm definitely using Google um, 3D. And I think, it, I feel that these drawings also speak to that, that how we now navigate our cities is with our smartphones and with our navigation tools in our cars. And we're very adept at flipping, tipping uh, landscapes and understanding cities differently. And so the series of drawings for Manchester also, I'm imagining when we're in that room and looking at all four of them, the angles constantly are tipping and rotating. And I, I do enjoy that that's reflecting our new way that we navigate cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think uh, related um, sorry, I'm just trying to group these questions together in a way that might make sense for how we're talking about this. Um, well, there's a couple of questions. So, um, you know, people are wondering, and as, as, as we will find out when we have the drawings on view, um, how have your art projects uh, influenced urban design, later influenced urban designer policies? And I think there maybe you can talk about your one work that be became a public artwork. Um, and, um, yeah, actually two people asked a similar question. So I, don't know. I think I'm, I think I'm also grappling with that myself, uh, up to very recently, I've produced this kind of heavily researched work that has then ended up in, uh, galleries or, or community shows or museum shows. And only, only last year did a curator sort of invite me to, produce a billboard and so we the work changed and it became a kind of information campaign to the neighborhood because there was big big development happening that was going to massively gentrify a neighborhood and the community around it we felt needed to know about how their neighborhood was going to be changed and impacted and so that was the first time that I stepped pushed my work out of a out of a gallery out of a museum and into public space and it's definitely a route I want to continue but I I don't see my I see my work as starting conversations and raising questions I don't see it as providing solutions and answers although you know it's interesting how more and more I'm working with um, some architectural groups and and entering into dialogue with them but I I do feel my role is much more to provoke questions than than to than to give answers and I think that that leads a lot of people are asking um, you know sort of 
questions about that and, and you know how either you or we the museum feel this work um, may or may lead to greater impacts and obviously our intentions is to use the the work as a, a jumping off point for community conversations um, because it is this interesting uh, artistic take as we said before incredibly subjective but also using a lot of objectivity and uh, as a outsider in every every sense of the word and you kind of dropped in as a visitor spent a lot of time there and at one point in time I think knew more about Manchester than certainly I did I felt I mean because you've been researching so much um, but that you were really able to see uh, the city in a way that was uh, uninfluenced by uh, either a love a love of the city because you had lived there or perhaps a less favorable view of the city because you had lived there or because you had never lived there and had only heard certain things about it, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and so that's sort of uh, what we're um, hoping for that. Someone asked um, if you were able to make order out of the chaos of, of that part of the city. Um, did, you, do you feel, did you feel like you understood it maybe? Um, you know, it's funny with the order and chaos, um, because I, I really like adding uh, complication and adding layers of uh, complexity. And I think it's, or, or, no, I don't think I made order out of chaos at all. I think it's, I think it's really challenging to think of what a medium-sized city in New Hampshire can be, because if shopping is better in Boston or Amazon, uh, and how do you get little boutiques or little shops to thrive? How do you how do you start to fill in so walkability? So it feels great to walk from A to B. Like it, they're really challenging. But then it comes back to also issues of poverty. Like how do you how do you raise the the people in the center of the city out of poverty. Like, how do you, is it through that, is it through that minimum wage? Like, I, I find it, I find it incredibly complicated. And again, I'm, these are, I'm not, this is not my expertise. Like I, I come as this outside observer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think what, you know, none of, none of us could have anticipated. Um, obviously you came during the summer, which you had already acknowledged this time. It's a time in Manchester where we all realize it kind of empties out to, for lack of a better word, because the neighborhood that we're in especially is really enlivened by the several schools in the area, the high schools and the universities. Yeah. Um, and so you really had a, an experience of the city that highlighted those uh, inequities of people without third spaces and what do those third spaces become if there is no home in school or they mm -hmm. literally don't have a home um, or a school to be at, where are, where are they um, in that area? And now when the, uh, when the draw when the drawings are being well spoken about now and when they're seen um, eventually later this year we are now in this time of COVID mm -hmm. um, which has again changed how we view the, the city itself the city's infrastructure the 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 way that people interact with each other obviously um, yeah. and how that's exacerbated any of those existing issues and so that of course um, can only be contextualized through conversations around the drawings because the drawings are very much a snapshot of that time. So like including the Trump rally, those, so those drawings will always be the summer of 2019 when that happened. Yep. Um, and those will look different depending on what happens in November to, you know, how, how that will look to us then. Um, and so I think that that's something really important about the work um, and that it's really, forcing a close look at uh, what has happened. But it's also interesting because there are already, already some changes and small things, for example, the museum, when Larissa first got here, we asked her if she wanted a bike to get around more quickly. And she kind of remarked that after walking the sidewalk, she didn't really feel safe riding a bike on the, side, on the sidewalk she had to cross. They're a little um, in disrepair. But in just since Larissa's left, the, the one of the streets um, that borders the courier and soon one of the others uh, have now bike lanes. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of interesting how some of these smaller things that people, any everyone across the city top bottom have maybe noticed are things that we could use, including an outsider like Larissa um, are starting to happen. So already there's so much um, that's gone on. Um, we had two people ask a similar question 
wondering what your observations were about race in Manchester and, and what you saw that summer um, and either just generally or how that relates to your comments that you made when you were talking about Garrity Nord. Yeah, Inter interesting that I kept hearing about um, the great diversity in Manchester and yet I didn't see it anywhere. Um, and, I, and then when you look at statistics, I know it's a very white um, state and city and then we had interesting conversations, of course, with the Center for New Americans. And they were saying that they felt that as a, as a refugee, you know, as a, um, what's it called, a resettlement city, or settlement city, um, that um, it was mostly from Congo and f f earlier from Bhutan, although that's ebbing away, but that those communities equally feel, I think, a bit lost and and don't have those points of integration and access and moments of kind of coming together and i felt that too when i was thinking about the downtown like where are the spaces where you like sit on a plaza and see a bunch of people that you don't know or wouldn't normally cross paths with like that's how for me public space functions that i'm in in space with other people and we have very weak links but we we are experiencing each other and we're seeing each other and I, I remember asking where do you find that in manchester and somebody said oh, at the market basket so the grocery store yes I, I do i do see there was a whole range of people a whole so i was missing i was missing the places where one would come together naturally uh, in shared space. And I, 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 again, understand that this might not be that downtown core. Maybe it's the parks, the big soccer fields or somewhere else. Maybe that downtown core does not have much to offer a new arrival family without much money because the restaurants are far too expensive, or it's not a place you'd want to bring young kids because if there's, it isn't the great playground or because of the devastation with the opioid crisis. So I think there's also reasons why um, there's not those sites of coming together that I had sort of expected hope to find. Right, and then it really, it really uh, reinforces the idea that you did look at, that you were looking at a rel the yes, the downtown core, but a relatively small portion of the city. So when Absolutely. you did conversations with people and they would say, well, if you go to this neighborhood or this neighborhood or this neighborhood, but because that's not where you were looking at, but that is again to say what you're saying, well, if that's a downtown core and that's what people are calling the center of the city, should the center of the city still not be accessible, usable, desirable to visit from the people in all these neighborhoods that um, you know people were having conversations um, with you about. Um, I um, I'm trying to I know we're a little bit over. I'm trying to answer a couple more questions. Um, someone asked a question: with the impact of the museum on Manchester, and I'll answer that um, very quickly because I do want to leave a lot of time for our artists and try to answer these questions. Um, but sort of as we're talking about with bringing in, you know, Larissa and other resident artists who are looking at our community and 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 doing projects like this, uh, where they're using their artistic lens and um, and a whole different lens than the the museum itself as a whole might have um, to kind of open our eyes, introduce us to new things, help us figure out different avenues of connection, um, and that's just talking about when we're working with artists specifically, but generally our, um, our educators and um, my colleagues who work in community outreach are doing really amazing work um, across the board, developing programs specifically uh, um, for certain groups, for example, the uh, museum was the first museum uh, to create a program specifically for um, families who are uh, dealing with substance use disorder. And it's a program that brings people together um, through art to look at art for discussion um, and sort of um, kind of friends and healing around these discussions. And that was something that we started a few years ago. Um, and so really trying to respond to the needs the way that an art museum can with, with art, with an opening, you know, creative space for free expression. Um, and so there's a lot that's sort of a good question to answer, but I'm going to mention a few things and, um, and that you'll mention out some of the other programs that we run, that we're trying to run remotely um, now, as unfortunately I've infected that a lot of things are, are still ongoing as we can. I'm going to try to wrap a couple of these questions together. People are asking, where did your love of art begin and do you enjoy getting lost? So I'm going to turn that into a question of your initial interest in, you know, what brought you to make art like this? Um, and um, 
and yeah, the, the idea of getting lost is kind of fun. Yeah, uh, there's an like, easy answer is architect dad, artist mother, so like me. Um, but uh, I, I think also it comes from living in different cities. So moving from English Vancouver to French Montreal and trying to figure out all the codes of how that city functions, then moving to Berlin. And also because my lang French wasn't so good in Montreal and then my German was not great in Berlin at the beginning. Now they're both fine. But at the beginning, it's trying to understand place through watching because language skills are not up to fully enter society. Um, so it's, it's, and even if my language skills were up, the codes are so different and the do's and don'ts and all, uh, all of the unwritten rules and how people navigate space. I think it's, I think for me, that's my interest in looking at cities also is why, why a Berlin city has that kind of attitude and, and people function like that. Whereas in French, uh, in Paris, like all of a sudden gender becomes really important and really key and to what it means to be a woman. So why is that different? And, and, in, and, and in North America, it was hilarious to get the comments about nice hair. Like, I just thought it's interesting to watch how individuality and all of the, there's other core things that get heightened. So yeah, I think it's, it's about watching why and how people are different in different places. Um, I think those are, I think we pretty much touched on um, most of most of those questions and I know we're a bit over. Um, so I, I do just want to say thank you again for spending time with us today. And for everyone uh, who attended the talk, thank you for coming. Um, I know it's hard. I was actually just answering a question personally. I'll just say it out loud that you can't come see the drawings anytime soon. Um, they won't be on display until later this year. This year, so please do um, check back for an announcement on that exact timing. But also, the museum is still currently closed. There's more information on our website of uh, the planned reopening, which is going to, which we are hoping is in August. Um, so again, please uh, follow the courier on all of our social media sites and check into our website often to see updates uh, on that and all the new policies that will be in place to keep everyone safe and healthy um, and get back to the art, uh, which we all want to do. Um, so thank you again, Larissa. Any, any final uh, words before we leave everyone? No, I just hope I get to come and visit again. So I, we do too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too. All right, well, thank you again and thank you everyone. Um, and please do uh, just keep, keep in touch with the courier. Uh, we wanna hear how everyone's doing and we're looking forward to seeing everyone back in the museum um, in weeks, we hope. Um, so thank you and Laura. So we'll look forward to seeing you again someday in the future. Thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank have a good you. night, Marissa. Yeah. Bye. Bye.